destroyed all the rest of them for disobedience, why would he go get a group of people who were never being obedient and say, oh, well, you don't have to be? That makes him kind of wishy-washy God, doesn't it? Yeah, evidently their God is not our Yahweh. I mean, if you stop and think about it, the whole thing just doesn't, just doesn't fit, doesn't have any, any reasoning behind it. Verse 7, so Moshe came. <clears throat> and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which Yahweh commanded him. Verse 8, then all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. Yahweh said, You go down and tell my people. And then he went up and told them what the people said. And they said, Everything he said, we're going to do. You know, these people are saying they're going to obey all of it before they heard it all. Yeah. Now at some point in time, all of us, reached a point where we decided, hey, you know, we've got to know who this, this creator of the universe is. And we went to him and we prayed and we said, everything that you have for us, we want, we want to know what it is. But we didn't get it all at one time. It's a process. <laughs> and he's been training us. And uh, all of these words, he came out in the third month. He sent these words down. They were going to be a, a set-apart nation, a kingdom of priests, okay? <clears throat> the people said, okay, everything he said, we're going to do. Now go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is that book right in front of Matthew. <laughs> In, in Matthew cha Malachi chapter 3, in verse 16 through 18. Now, the prophets were always sent down to go there and tell his people to repent and turn back in obedience to my word. He sent these prophets with his message because the people were not obeying. They weren't doing what they said they were going to do. When the, when the children of Israel bound themselves to obey Yahweh's word on that mountain there, they actually committed all their descendants. That's what happens in covenant. You make a promise and all your descendants are bound by that same covenant. But your descendants are not going to walk in that covenant if they're not taught to. In verse 16 of Malachi 3, it said, Then those who feared Yahweh spoke to one another, and Yahweh listened and heard so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear Yahweh and who meditate or esteem his name. How many people today esteem or even think about his name? How many of them know what it is? How many of them care? Verse 17, he says, They shall be mine, says Yahweh of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels or my special treasure. Now what do you say over there? They're going to be a special treasure to me in verse 5 of Exodus. The same thing. And then here he says, On the day that I make them my special treasure, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves ill and one who does not serve him. If you don't want to serve him, and if you can make everybody believe that his instruction has been done away with, then you can go serve who? Yourself. Your choice. Now go back to Deuteronomy 7. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 7. <clears throat> and uh, in verses 6 through 8. 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat> now he's saying here in verse 6 of Deuteronomy 7, For you are a set-apart people to Yahweh. <clears throat> Yahweh Eloheka has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special 
treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. You reckon that's one reason why so many people don't like to be Jewish people? Probably. Or the children of Israel? They never said they were special. Well, Yahweh did. They're special to him. And no matter what, he said, again, I will choose Jerusalem. And he always has a special place. But when the people still don't walk in obedience to his word, then he what? He'll cast them off. And then in verse 7, he says, Yahweh did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. But because Yahweh loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. Throughout the scripture, this is all about Yahweh keeping the oath that he swore to Abraham, right? And the oath and the promise that he swore to Abraham was that he was going to give them what? The land and the covenant. And that covenant, which is what he is working so hard to give to the people if they obey him, is what everybody today is saying that covenant is done away with. we got a new covenant. Because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, Yahweh has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Therefore know that Yahweh Eloheka, he is Elohim, the faithful El, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Sure sounds a whole lot different from what's being taught today in organized religions. <clears throat> go back to Isaiah, but this time go to chapter 61. <clears throat> Isaiah 61, and in verse 6. But you shall be named the priest of Yahweh. It's implied that men shall call you the servants of Eloheinu. You shall eat the riches of the nations of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you will have double. Honor is implied. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. Well, those that this was promised to rejected it. They died in the wilderness, and it belongs to the sons. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. In verses 4, 5, and 6. 1 Peter chapter 2. And he says in verse 4, Coming to him a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Yahweh through Jehoshua the Mashiach. Peter is writing exactly the same thing that we're being told in Torah and the prophets about being a set-apart nation. We're still supposed to be priesthood. We're still supposed to minister to the people. The same words of instruction that he gave through Moses never changed. The only difference is in the blood sacrifice. Instead of through the animals, it's through Messiah Yehoshua. That's the only difference. Verse 6, Therefore it's also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. If you believe on him, if you believe on Messiah Yehoshua, if he is the word made flesh, then you're believing on the word as well as him because he is that word. You can't separate the two. <clears throat> a kingdom of priests, the sons of Israel are to be a kingdom of priests. Now since the duty of a priest is to minister between man and Yahweh, so the sons of Israel have been chosen to bring the other nations to Yahweh. Okay? The term holy nation in, in the Hebrew there is the Vagoyi Kadosh, a set apart nation, separated from the false beliefs and idolatry of other nations, separated from the traditions of men, separated to the obedience of the Torah of Yahweh. Are, are you, that's what this set apart means, right? 
our works of obedience show who we are not what we say but our works of obedience show who we are when we say something and then we're doing something else then what we're saying is a lie compared to what we're doing go to Romans 12 so many times people do things based on humanism a man told me one time we're trapped in the ideas and traditions and thoughts of our fathers and, and things that we've been raised up with and the, and the traditions of habit keep us from accepting the truth of what scripture says but in Romans chapter 12 verses 14 through 21 He says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Now notice that associate with the humble. What is humble? To mean to submit yourself in obedience to Yahweh. So you what? Associate yourself with those who are submitted to Yahweh. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahweh. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If he's your enemy, you don't have to take vengeance. Yahweh is going to do it. In the verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What is good? Obedient to Yahweh's word. Messiah himself said, I always do those things which please the Father. The question is, do we? And if we're going to please the Father, what do we have to do? Same thing Abraham did. Abraham believed Yahweh. If his word says something, you believe it and just act accordingly. If we let traditions of people or if we let traditions of humanism or, or any other type of tradition that's been brought up by any other thing <clears throat> defer our belief away from what the word says to something, you know, something else. Oh, well, it can't be that, you know. Oh, surely all them, you know, all them people out there are such good people. Surely they're not going to die just because they break the Torah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, just I'm thinking about it, a lot of pain when you begin to recognize the truth. There is a lot of pain when you begin to recognize the truth and you begin to associate with other people. Everything in your life has to be based on what this word says. And unfortunately, all of our families are not walking in obedience to Torah. And in the end times, and it says many, you know, are called, but few are chosen or deemed entirely deserving. There's only a remnant. I guarantee you, all the people are going to be destroyed. Somebody's brother, sister, father, mother children, what have you. It's going to be that way. A lot of pain in knowing that we can't ignore it, but you can't let that destroy your belief in what the Word says either. <clears throat> to go back to, <clears throat> to Exodus now. <laughs> Again in verse 8. And the reason that I'm expounding on that is because all of us that, that claim that we want to know the truth, and we told y'all that sometime, everything that you have for me, I want. Everything you want me to do, I want to do. That's what they said, verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken, we will do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. And one of the things that he said to do is to believe what Yahweh said. And sometimes we really don't believe some of the things of Yahweh because... The traditions of habit won't allow us to. Verse 9, And Yahweh said to Moshe, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. How long are they supposed to believe Moses? <clears throat> well, until the year one. <laughs> or until we start counting backwards or up or down or whatever it is they're doing. There's no exceptions there. So the people believe you forever. So Moshe told the words of the people to Yahweh. So how long are they supposed to believe Moses? 
Then Yahweh said to Moshe, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Verse 10 said, Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, Yahweh will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the peoples. Notice what's getting ready to happen here. Yahweh just didn't say these things to Moses. Then Moses go to all the people. All these people are going to come out and, and Yahweh is going to send down and Yahweh himself is going to be heard by the people. Now we're told later on that nobody's ever seen the form of Yahweh or heard his voice. So who are they going to see and hear on that mountain? Yehoshua. It's going to be the word and the voice of Yehoshua. The voice of Yehoshua speaking the words of Yahweh, the Torah. I know these are some hard concepts, but if you believe what the scripture says, this is what the scripture tells us. And we have to put it together in that order. If we try to rationalize it, you know, we just rationalize things right out of existence. Yehoshua is Yahweh. <clears throat> But they're going to know that the words are from Yahweh and they're not just the creation of Moses himself. That's why Yahweh said, you know, bring them out and they're going to hear these words. They're going to know it's from me and not just your creation. So there is proof that they came from Yahweh. And the entire nation is going to hear it. Go back to Matthew 5. <clears throat> In uh, verses 17 and 18, Messiah is speaking. And, and he's talking to the people in verse 7. Do not think that I came to destroy. That word destroy is at number 2647 in the Greek. It means destroy, to annihilate, <laughs> to make void, to annul, to do away with, to eliminate. He's saying, Do not think that I came to destroy. I didn't come to annihilate, to make void, or do away with. The Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that word fulfill, plera, means to what? To make complete or to bring to completion. Or the best definition of that word from the Greek is to bring into existence that which was prophesied. If you put this passage together with Luke 24, 44, it'll give you an exact picture of what he came to do. And now in verse 18 he says what? For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled or completed. Is there still anything left to be completed? If there is, then of course the words of Messiah, the law and the prophets are still for today. I don't know how people can get around that. And if they say, well, he fulfilled it all, well, then that means like he did away with it, right? And that's what he just said he wasn't going to do. <laughs> In Luke 16, uh, in verse 17, <laughs> Messiah again is speaking. He said, It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the Torah to fail. That word tittle there, it, it, it means it, the, the smallest stroke of the Hebrew letter. Even the little decorations on top of the letters. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one of these things to go away. Go back to in, in, in verse 16 there. Look look at verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. This is talking about Lazarus and the rich man. Mm -hmm. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man was down in the bad place, wherever you want to call it. And then verse 28, he says, For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He's saying, Send Lazarus back. Verse 29, Abraham said to him, Remember, the Messiah is telling the story. Remember, Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The word here, if he's speaking Hebrew, is Shema. Let them hear with understanding and obey. 
And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. If they do not hear and obey Moses and the prophets, you realize most people you talk to today, you can't get them to accept this. And they, they don't know, they don't believe Moses and the prophets because they don't know what they say. And all old stuff has been done away with. The only time they go back to Moses and the prophets is when they're searching for come out some kind of a blessing that they say it's ours today. Or something they want to get from it. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they, they be, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. And he knows he's the one that's going to rise from the dead and they don't believe him. They don't believe Moses and the prophets. Go back in Exodus again. We're going to move on. Again in verse 10 there he said, Then Yahweh said to Moshe, Go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. The people are to prepare themselves to receive the words of their Creator. Right? Remember the parable of Messiah told, the parable of the sowing of the seed? You know, and the soil, if the soil is prepared properly, then it can receive the word, the seed, and it will take root. If you're not prepared to receive it, what's going to happen? It's going to go away. <clears throat> the word sanctify there is a number 6942. The Hebrew word there is the word kadash. It means to be to make or to pronounce as clean before coming to receive the words of Yahweh. It's kind of like today, if people have not repented of what they have done, then they're not clean to receive the words of Yahweh. But if people have repented of things in their past and turned back and they want the truth, then they're really, they have prepared themselves to receive the words of Yahweh. And then they act on it. Go to Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> In uh, verse 1, <clears throat> And again he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. Then he taught them many things by parables, and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Now all those people that were prepared and ready to receive this word would receive it and bring forth, and that's what he's going through. All the different people and how they're going to receive it. Some are going to do something with it and some won't. And it all depends on the people. It's not him. He's the same one. He's giving the same word. When Messiah came, the only words he ever gave is the same words that Yahweh had given it's whether we are prepared to receive them to do something with them that makes a difference. Go back to... <clears throat> this same parable that Messiah was speaking to all those people that came out to hear him, we can hear that same thing right here in, 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 in Exodus. <clears throat> go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Let them go prepare themselves to receive the word. And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day Yahweh will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. How many times do we have reference to the third day? <laughs> and in verse 12, You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves, and you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. So he tells them to set boundaries. The people get busy then. They built building boundaries which were to protect the people. And we know, you know, from the from the surveys and everything, they found these markers, you know, there at Mount Mount uh, Musa, there in, in Arabia. <clears throat> no one can go up the mountain unless who? Unless Yahweh calls. Right? And if Yahweh called you to come up to him, if he's on the mountain or wherever he is, when Yahweh called you to come up to him, can we go up any other way other than the way he says come up? No way to go up to him without he calling us, right? So many religions today, and I'll use one example because we've all heard of the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism and, and the teaching and so forth in Kabbalah, which comes out of Orthodox Judaism. 
throughout Kabbalah, they're teaching men this is the, how to learn the way to go to God. Okay? But yet, we can't go to Him unless we go the way He said, right? And He said the way to Him is I'm giving you all these instructions on the earth and if you follow these instructions, I'll come get you. That's what He said. We don't really accept or believe that, that the only way to go to Yahweh is the way He said come. And that He gave us these instructions. While we're following these instructions, we're on the path to go to Him. We're on the path. We are predestined to become in the image of His Son. And His Son came and said, He's going back to be with the Father. And He said, I'm going to come back for you so that where I am, there you'll be also. So He's coming back to get us to take Him from wherever He is right now. Why can't people believe that? But the only way to go is according to His Word, the way He said. Take heed to yourselves. You do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot. At that time, he meant with an arrow. <laughs> or it could have been a stone in a sling, I guess. That's kind of like a bullet. just doesn't have a gunpowder. It's a lot quieter. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. When the, that word trumpet there is the word yobel, 3104. When the yobel sounds long, they shall come, <clears throat> that guy here come near the mountain, or come up into the mountain, or come up to the mountain, to the high place. That word Yahweh said he calls us to ride on the high place, he's going to call us to come up on the high place if we're obedient to them. Before we read verse 14, go with me to 2 Samuel. <clears throat> In uh, chapter 6. One through seven. If, if we think about it, Samuel, you know, of course, they've, they've been through, you know, the wilderness and, and, and the 40 years of wandering and the people had come in. We've gone through the time of, of Judges after they came in the Promised Land. We've gone through Joshua. And now here we are, you know, from the time of First and Second Samuel. And in Second Samuel here, David is king. In verse 1 it says, Again David gathered all the choice of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of El, whose name is called by the name Yahweh Sabaoth, who dwells, they got this word in there between. It actually means who dwells above the cherubim. It's what they call the lid of the box. King James translator translated those words as mercy seat, but it never, never meant that. Verse 3, So they set the ark of Elohim on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of El, and Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played before Yahweh on all kinds of, of, of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on cistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of El and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Did he do something bad? It wasn't bad motivation. He was just trying to protect it, wasn't he? But we know from the scriptures that nobody touches the ark. How is the ark supposed to be carried? By poles on the shoulders of the Levites. They weren't doing it Yahweh's way. It wasn't a bad thing that David wanted to bring it up, but he didn't do it his way. And what happened? Then the anger of Yahweh was aroused against Uzzah, and Elohim struck him there for his, they got the word era, Scripture says, for his irreverence that he died there by the ark of Elohim. Is it because God is mean? Or is it because Yahweh has given instructions that he expects to be carried out? That's what it amounts to. And because of disobedience of a man who didn't do it, you know, to be just... In fact, he wanted to honor Yahweh. He wanted to bring the ark up. He wanted to be there, right? Wasn't bad motivation, but method. And the method has to be Yahweh's way. And because of disobedience, it caused the death of a man who was even the son of a priest. He should have known. Disobedience always brings death to somebody. 
David's disobedience caused the death of another man. He was doing something he wasn't supposed to do, and all these things compound. Go back then. <clears throat> In verse 13, we read where it says, When the shofar, the yobel, blows. Verse 14, Then Moshe went down from the mountain of the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet. Now here the word trumpet is the 7782. It's the word shofar. <clears throat> uh, the sound of the shofar was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Most of you already know how, what I'm talking about on this, but for those who haven't heard and don't know, that get the tapes right out in the telephone land. This is the first time that these people have ever heard the blowing of the shofars. Okay? And who's blowing it? It's not the people. It's not Moses. It's not the Levites. They hear the sound of the shofar being blown by somebody. And he'd already told him, when you hear the sound of the shofar, are you going to what? You're going to go up. Go back and look at verse 13 again there. When the trumpet sounds long, I'm just in the last part of it. When the trumpet, the, show, the, the yobel sounds long, they shall what? Come up. Or shall come near. Or to go up to. The word that's being translated there in that verse 13 is, is the number 5927, Allah. It means to ascend up. It's the same word used for the burnt offering, meaning to ascend up or to come near to Him. The burnt offering or the burnt sacrifice is something that totally goes up to Him. Right? Remember when, when He met in, in Judges, He met with the mother of Samson and, and, and her, her husband, Manoah? And they went out and they laid the sacrifice on top of the rock and he had caused the fire to come up out of the rock and, and you know, and it took the food. And what did he do? He stepped up on the rock and he stepped up in the fire and he ascended and went up in the fire. He didn't eat it. But they had come near, you know. And in their actions, they had been what? Totally set aside to him. That's what a burnt offering is. It's totally set aside to him. <clears throat> Now this word, you know, this ola, it, it means to ascend. It can also mean to be taken up, to be brought up, or to be taken away. Uh, I'll show you a couple of other places where the same word is used to mean that. Go to the book of Joshua, Jehoshua, in chapter 6. <clears throat> and uh, in verse 5, Then it shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn. When you hear the sound of the trumpet that all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city will fall down flat and the people, Ola, shall go up. Every man straight before him. We've all heard the song that people used to love to sing, Shout for he has given us a city. Okay. Well, <clears throat> how did they capture the city of Jericho, the city of Palms? Did they fight against it? Or did they all go out and march around the city for seven days? And then on the seventh day, what? They shouted, blow the shofar, and the wall fell down, and every man went straight up before him to go into the city. Look at verse 20, same chapter. <clears throat> so the people shouted when the priest blew the shofars, the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout. The wall fell down flat. Then the people went up, to same word, Allah, into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. It's kind of like at the end of all things, when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, right? And they're going to be, what, the sound of, 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 a, of a shofar? The great trump? Something, gonna, you know, we're all going to go up somewhere. Somebody goes into the city. Who can go into the city? Those who keep the commandments. Go to Judges <coughs> chapter 13. In verse 20, I, I mentioned this a while ago. 
in, in verse 20, chapter 13 of Judges. This was Manoah and his wife, you know, who had been spoken to by, by Jehoshua concerning the birth of, of their son, Shimshon, or Samson. Verse 19, So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to Yahweh, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. As the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, it happened that the angel of Yahweh ascended, Ola, went up in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. They realized who that was. You remember later on, he would have told his wife, Oh my gosh, we've seen Yahweh. He goes, we're going to die. She said, you crazy. If we're going to die, he wouldn't have accepted our offering. We ain't going to die. And people get so, you know. We go back into Exodus. That's what he's saying here. Again in verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud of the mountain, and the sound of the shofar was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. But they came out. Moses led them out. Moses is the one that had them prepared to go out when they heard the sound of the shofar. If they hadn't have known that Moses said on the sound of the shofar, you come out on the third day when they heard the book, they said they would have never gone out, would they? They would have known what it was. Somebody's got to be looking for the sound of the shofar. Isn't that what Paul said? With the great trump. Then we shall all be caught up to meet with him in the air. Isn't that what he says? I don't know how anybody can argue that that's going to happen. You can argue all day long about when, but the fact that it's going to happen is, is clear from Scripture. <laughs> in, in verse 16 there, uh, the sound of the trumpet of the shofar literally the Hebrew reads, the voice of the shofar. In Revelation, we see John seeing a man down there, you know, and he heard a voice behind him as it was what? The sound of a trumpet. But it was the voice of Yahweh. And he was what? Standing in the midst of all the lampstands. And that's what it says in Revelation. The, the voice as it was the sound of a trumpet. I mean, Scripture says that. And then go to Hebrews 12. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18, <clears throat> 18 through 21 here, in, in Hebrews 12. For you have not come to the mountain that being touched and that burned with fire into blackness and darkness and tempest. See, he's talking about this, this passage which we're reading over here. Verse 19, And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure what was commanded. And then he's quoting from Exodus 19. And in so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight. Moshe said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. Now this adds to what we were reading over there. The sound of the trumpet and the voice of words. <clears throat> Look down at verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. I'm still in Hebrews 12. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve Yahweh acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our El is a consuming fire. What is this grace that we have? The fact that when we sin, we don't have to bring the animal sacrifice anymore, but we confess our sin, and because of the sacrifice Yehoshua made, we have been what? Received back into the bosom of the Father because of the sacrifice of Yehoshua. <clears throat> Go to Leviticus 23.
Leviticus chapter 23 is the chapter where he establishes all of his festivals, his feast days that we are supposed to celebrate. <clears throat> and in verse 24, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first, the new moon, the beginning of the month, you should have a what? A Shabbaton, a memorial a remembrance of blowing of shofars, a holy convocation. What are we supposed to remember? The blowing of the shofar. Where are we ever told that there was a great blowing of shofars when it got louder and louder and louder and louder? Took place back in Shabbat, right? When they came out of Egypt. So here we are celebrating on the first day. Now what took place, if we go back and read, all these people are coming out, go back to Exodus, all these people are coming out to meet with Yahweh and he's fixing to give them something. It's called a ketubah, a wedding contract. You give that to somebody at the betrothal. And the promise is that he's going to come back for a bride. Isn't that what all of New Testament talks about is him coming for a spotless bride? <clears throat> Again, verse 16, Then it came to pass on the third day, in the morning, <laughs> Bubble care, <laughs> in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud in the mountain, and the sound of the shofar was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with El, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Moshe is the friend of the bridegroom. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, same mountain, different language. <laughs> and when the blast of the shofar sounded long and became louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and El answered him by voice. <clears throat> Back up just a little bit, verse 17. Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with them. They stood at the foot of the mountain. The word at the foot is the number 8482. It's the Hebrew word takath, like T-A-C-H-A-T-H, takath. The root of the word is number 8478. The word at the foot is an idiomatic Hebrew expression According to the Brown Driver Briggs Jesenius Hebrew lexicon. And the word at the foot means under or beneath, quote, like a bride stations herself under the hoopah beside the bridegroom. <laughs> the idiomatic expression, that's what it means. So what they stage themselves at the foot or under. So the whole thing is a picture of, of the betrothal. Moses led the people out of the camp. Moshe, the Torah, leads us out of the world. Okay? <clears throat> Go back to Hebrews 13. In uh, verse 14 and 15. Excuse me, 12 and 14 of Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 12, Therefore Yehoshua also, that he might sanctify or set apart the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. And what is the city to come? The new Yerushalayim. And only those who keep the commandments of Yahweh will enter into that city. And how do we go? When his voice says, come up here. And nobody can come until he calls. <clears throat> go to Ephesians 5. There's a lot of people who are not going to be prepared to hear. Been believing all this old stuff is done away with. 
Many are called, but few are chosen or deemed entirely deserving. Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 26. Two verses there. Notice what Paul is saying to, the, to the, those at Ephesus, and he's writing, you know, and he's giving them a, a parable here, and he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Hamashiach, the anointed of Yahweh, loved the ecclesia, the called out ones, and gave himself for them, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious ecclesia, or called out ones, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Is he not talking about the ecclesia, the called out ones, the bride, the body of Messiah? That's the bride that he came to get. That's who he's thinking you're coming for. The betrothal to the children of Israel. Who's he coming back for? And Messiah said, I've been sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Anybody that joins with him becomes part of that house of Israel. So we go back there and look at, at, at verse 19. And when the blast of the trumpet, see, that's the word said, said made it to the shofar, referring to the ram's horn. We blow the shofar at the beginning of every Sabbath. You're trying to get people to understand this is what we're talking about. Now, I guarantee you no man could hold the sound of the shofar the way that scripture said it when it got louder and louder and longer and longer and louder. <laughs> <clears throat> verse 20 then Yahweh came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and Yahweh called Moshe to the top of the mountain and Moshe went up and Yahweh said to Moshe go down and warn the people lest they break through to see Yahweh and many of them perish lest they break through the gates now back in verse 12 the people were warned against even touching the mountain, you know. He said, if anybody comes up or anything else, it'll be shot or, shot or stoned or something, you know. And it was under penalty of death, right? But he states it a second time right here. Warn the people lest they break through to see Yahweh and many of them perish. A lot of people out there ain't nothing in the world but just kind of, what they call them, you know, if you have an accident on the highway and they're going by, they're rubberneckers. They don't want to be part of it. They just want to see it. <laughs> affects everybody else and calls other people up just because they want to see. But anyway, <clears throat> go back to Hebrews 12. In uh, verses 14 and 15 now of Hebrews 12. Pursue peace with all and Holiness, set apartness, without which no one will see Yahweh. Looking diligently, that don't mean kind of, kind of, sort of halfway, you know, every now and then. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of El, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, if everybody talks about today when we try to talk to them, oh, we're all under grace. Well, in case you hadn't noticed it there, you can fall short of the grace of hell. How do they do that? Lest anyone fall short of the grace of hell, lest any root of bitterness bring them cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. If you're not walking in obedience to Yahweh's word, you are falling short of the grace of Yahweh. Is that not true? <clears throat> <laughs> don't know Tori you can't walk in it so going back again there again in verse 21 <clears throat> we're, in 20, yeah, we're in 22 now also let the priests who come near Yahweh sanctify or consecrate themselves lest Yahweh break out against them the word priest there is the number 50, uh, 3548 it's the word Kohen K-O-H-E-N Kohen is the priest Kohen Haggadol would be the high priest, but Kohen is just a priest. Now, the question is here, what priest? We don't even have a priesthood established yet, do we? Oh, wait a minute now, we just read over there, he was going to have a whole nation of priests. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> 
All of them are going to become priests. I'm just trying to get us to notice here, he's, he's mentioning these things, priest. Here he said, let the priest who come near and everything, but we don't really have a priesthood established yet. He had not named, you know, who the high priest is and, and what the instructions are. He's beginning to lead them into where he wants them to be. But here he says, and let the priest who come near Yahweh sanctify themselves or set themselves or consecrate themselves lest Yahweh break out against them. Maybe the ones that are officiating. You know, he talked about those, you know, the elders become judges and so forth. Those are really not priests, are they? But sanctify again means to make themselves clean. 69.42, Kadash. Now verse 23, And Moshe said to Yahweh, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and sanctify it or consecrate it. And Moses said, Oh, the people can't come up. You done said it. Verse 24, Then Yahweh said to him, Away, get down, and then come up. You and I are wrong with you, but do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. He said, You and who? And Aaron with you, but don't let anybody else come up. Right now, the only ones that can come up is Moses and Aaron. The lawgiver and the light bringer. <laughs> only two he's bringing up. Remember, Aaron is, is, is the light bringer. Moses is the lawgiver. Moses, who is drawn out, <laughs> his name means to drawn out. So the ones who are drawn out and the light bringer. The other one, the ones that can come up. In Matthew, again, we're all told, we're going to be sons of light. <laughs> Let your light show sign before men. We're supposed to be the sons of the light. We're drawn out. And who's going to go up? Just the sons of light. Go up with the one that's drawn out. So Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. <clears throat> In uh, verse 24, the word away... Get away. The number 1980. <clears throat> the word itself, this form here is lek, like L-E-K, if you were to put it in English transliteration. The root word is halak. Remember, halaka is the word from halak, which means to walk or how to walk, and it's your way of life or the way to live, okay? It means to go or to walk or to come. Jewish people have a whole mess of laws and everything they call their halakha, which is the way that they're trying to teach everybody to live, which doesn't really include anything in Torah. Most of it's Talmud. But here I'm trying to say that this word away means to walk. The next word just means get down or to descend. So he's saying walk down, then ascend you and bring Aaron. But do not let the priest and the people break through. <clears throat> and then chapter 20. <clears throat> In this chapter, we're going to see the ten, what people call the ten commandments or the ten words, okay? The ten matters. Actually, they're not necessarily commandments or words or anything else. These are the things the instruction Yahweh has given. And out of these ten things, you know, there's got to be some instructions along with it on how to perform these ten so to speak. <clears throat> so he's saying, and Elohim spoke all these words saying, <clears throat> Ani Yahweh Eloheka, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then in verse 3, you shall have no other Elohim before me. Now, verses 1, 2, and 3 in, in English, in Christianity, this is considered the first commandment. But the Hebrew understanding of the first commandment is uh, verse 1 and 2. Yahweh spoke, I am Yahweh, the Elohim of Egypt who brought you out of the house of God. They're, they're saying that that is the number one commandment. And look how many times throughout Scripture he says, I, mean, I am Yahweh, I am Yahweh. So people won't follow some other to let them know who he is. <clears throat> Remember, Yahweh is the one who delivered them out of Egypt. He is the one who sets us free. Go back with me to John 8. Gospel of John. What chapter? 
John chapter 8. Did I say chapter 8? John 8, verse 32 through 36. He said, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jehoshua answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So when we go back over that, he's saying, I am Yahweh el who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Who brought them out and made them free? Yehoshua. Yehoshua is the one who makes us free. Yehoshua is the one who sets us free from the house of sin. Who sets us free from being slaves to sin. Or bondage. Again, in verse 3, that you shall have no other Elohim before me. And that phrase, the word before me, literally, in the Hebrew, is, is the number 5921 plus 6440. 5921 is all, and then 6440 is, is panim, and the phrase is all, pa'aniyah. And since the word 6440 means in the presence of, then the word 5921 means concerning or beside or in addition to or together with, above or over. He can be saying, you shall have no other God's Elohim in the presence of or in addition to or alongside with me or besides me or, or next to me or, or you know, near. There's a lot of people who like to say, oh yeah, Yahweh is our God, but they look at other things along with him. Remember when, when Egypt, I mean, when uh, Assyria came down and took all of the nation of Israel captive and took them out of the land. And then they went back and they spoke to Yahweh and they said, hey, the people that, that you're bringing in from all these other nations, they don't know Yahweh, the, the, the true Elohim of the land, okay? So he said, okay, go up and get some Levites and bring them down to teach them about who the Yahweh of the land is. So they begin to teach all these people about the Yahweh that belongs to the land of Israel and all his rules and regulations. So they said, okay, we'll accept him. So they accepted him along with all their other gods. And that's the very thing that Yahweh said you shall not do. A lot of people come out of the world today, you know, in bondage to it, and they say, okay, I'll accept Yahweh, but then they want to keep a lot of their other things that they look to as God along with him. And he said, you shall have no others along with me. Go to Jeremiah 25. <clears throat> In Jeremiah chapter 25 and in verse 6, <clears throat> this is the word that came to Jeremiah, Jeremiah from Yahweh. And in verse 6 he said, Do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, and I will not harm you. It's kind of like saying, if you do the other, then I will harm you. But don't go after these other gods. Go to Jeremiah 35. In verse 15. And he's saying, I have also sent to you all my servants, the prophets, Rising up early and sending, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way. Amend your doings and do not go after other gods to serve them. Then you will dwell in the land which I have given you and your fathers. But you have not inclined your ear nor obeyed me. Again, he's saying, You don't have any other gods. And he told us that time after time after time. In Matthew 6, In verse 24. Now, I don't want people to think that I'm saying it's bad to have money. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what he's saying in this verse. Verse 24 of Matthew. Wait a minute. I'm in the wrong book. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, 
I was in the right chapter and verse, but I was in, Matthew, in, in Luke instead of Matthew. But in Matthew 6, 24, Messiah said, No one can serve two masters. For he, he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve El and Mammon or riches. See, he's talking about riches. The things of the world as being a god is what people look to as being one of their gods. And if you're trying to serve that one, you can't serve Yahweh. Because he's going to hate one and love the other. And this type of thing. That's what I would, over there in Luke, in, in chapter 6 and verse 24, is talking about the same thing. Anyone who has riches, you know, talking about it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> if, 